All right, well, thank you, Anna. Uh, and I want to thank SLU for the opportunity to talk with you today. It's a great pleasure to be back in Sweden. We were uh, fortunate enough to visit for the first time last year, and uh, we're in Alnarp with uh, some of our colleagues who are remotely watching there. And um, this, But this is first time this far north. I know it's not that far north, but we're making our way. Um, and I want to uh, put our work at the Land Institute on perennial agriculture, specifically uh, perennial grain agriculture in uh, ecological context. And then uh, towards the end of the presentation, I will specifically describe some of the work that we're doing, uh, an overview at, at the Land Institute in Kansas. Let's see, so is, is this where the slides are gonna be? Yeah. Okay. All right, yes. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> Up until 10,000 years ago or so, uh, there were virtually, virtually no terrestrial ecosystems dominated by annual plant species for more than a handful of years at a time. And then came the beginning of our food producing ecosystem an ecosystem that I think is, is dear to our hearts and our psyches. I think most of us, when we see a field of barley uh, or wheat, ha have a sense of beauty, similar to what we experience when we look at some of the previous ecosystems, some natural ecosystems. And I think there's a good reason for this. Agriculture is food, it is energy, it is security, and we've come not to really question our food producing ecosystem. Even ecologists hardly question the, the, the existence of this ecosystem. And yet, underlying it is a compromised ecosystem. On an annual basis, when we remove all vegetation and reset the ecosystem back to square one, early secondary succession in ecological terms, um, we encounter some problems. Probably the most uh, known is soil erosion, and arguably still the most serious. This is a picture taken a couple of years ago in uh, central Iowa in the US, a major corn producing area, an area that has some of the highest level agricultural science applied to the landscape anywhere on the planet. And yet even with no-till production, we see significant soil erosion taking place if the rains fall at just the wrong time, right around now and in the previous two months. Montgomery, in a, in a pretty well-cited PNAS paper in 2007, made some global estimates of rates of soil formation. This is the median global rate of soil formation. And the median rates of soil loss in plowed agriculture, which in, in grain is about 95% of the agricultural landscape on the planet still. And this number goes down substantially with no-till, um, as can be seen in these median rates. But when you compare the rate of soil formation to the rate of soil loss, we recognize that we still have a problem. And we recognize that agriculture itself has largely depended on the soil capital built under these native ecosystems. And it's just been a slow degradation on a lot, a lot of landscapes. And in places like where I'm from in Kansas, we have very deep mollusols to work through. And so in 125, 150 years, we don't see a landscape that looks like this very much. It happens. This is in Iowa also. Um, but it is arguably the future. That is certainly what Montgomery ar argues in this paper. Um, and it was the future in Mesopotamia, in the Lust Plateau of China, 
in the Altiplano of Mexico and the center of many great civilizations that experienced some degree of collapse that has been linked to agriculture. The alternative, of course, to the plow these days is, is the use of herbicides to control competing vegetation, which is mainly why we plow. And yet, this is running into trouble too. Uh, in the US, where we broadly use the two molecule approach to uh, controlling weeds, Roundup and the gene that codes for Roundup resistance, the, the two molecules, um, we are spraying Roundup over a remarkable acreage of the landscape in the US. This is total cropland under genetically engineered crops. And these are the herbicide tolerant crops, the percentages of the landscape in the US that are currently occupied by those. And what we're seeing though is, of course, very predictably resistance to Roundup. There's over 20 species of weeds. This is amaranthus, uh, uh, but many others that are showing strong resistance to Roundup, virtually making it certain that it will become useless as a single herbicide anyway in the foreseeable future. And of course, Monsanto and other, other companies are working on cocktails and alternative um, herb herbicide resistance genes um, to replace just simple Roundup applications. And I put this up to, to uh, some of you may have heard that there was a WHO study recently that suggests, in fact, that Roundup is probably a carcinogen. This caused great controversy in, in our part of the world. Um, it may or it may not be, and it really doesn't matter because it's going to be replaced by some things that we know are more problematic, atrazine being the, the herbicide of choice that Roundup replaced. And, er, and atrazine is known to have endocrine disruption properties and, and a likely carcinogen as well. And, th and then there's a whole host of other herbicides being worked on. But this is, it's a question of do we want to cover a majority of the landscape in, in the food producing areas on an annual basis with a chemical that our evolutionary history and those of the orga other organisms occupying the landscape have not encountered before. So soil loss is, is probably still the greatest single problem of annual agriculture. It doesn't receive a lot of attention, but in the long run, it is the Achilles heel. But there are some other shortcomings as well. Um, one of which that, that happens pretty much ubiquitously is the loss of soil carbon when, when fields are initially plowed. These are two sites, one in Nebraska, US, one in Alberta, Canada. Um, this is time zero when the uh, grassland or prairie was still intact. And how much of the soil organic carbon declines over the first seven decades of agricultural production. And typically between 20, 30, up to 70% of the soil organic matter is going to be um, burned off, initially because of exposing uh, physically protected aggregates to oxygen and sunlight. Uh, microbes love these conditions and, and become much more active and burn through soil organic matter at a rate that's faster when the soil is intact. But there's another reason why this happens, and I'll mention it in a few minutes. So decline in soil organic matter. Um, another is the formation of uh, dead zones and just the general eutrophication of water bodies because of the inability for annually cropped landscapes to retain or hold on to nutrients. Um, this is true in organic production as well. Uh, you, the, the growing season or, or nutrient availability does not begin and end with the cropping season of annual crops. And uh, in the US, we have the, the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico, the size of New Jersey. Um, you have the, the Baltic dead zone, which is not exclusively driven by agricultural uh, runoff, but as I understand, 
um, nutrients from agriculture are involved. This is very complex puzzle you have here with the balding. But there's on the order of 140 major dead zones at the mouths of rivers around the world. There are many interesting theories as to why we went down the path of agriculture, of annual agriculture, in multiple times and multiple places over the last 10,000 years. But improving ecosystem resilience and sustainability were not among them. And I think this is really important to remember. We didn't do this because it was sustainable. Why did we do it? Well, there, there's, there's quite a few interesting theories, and I, I would invite you to look at this paper that a couple of my colleagues at the Land Institute authored uh, in 2010, Mist Missing Domestication Plant Forms Can artificial, artificial Selection Fill in the Gap, that runs through quite a few hypotheses as to why we chose annual crops to begin with and why we didn't start originally selecting on perennials. It's, it's very interesting. But since we began farming, the practices of agriculture have changed dramatically, um, and most notably with respect to energy in the last 100 years. We have essentially figured out how to apply fossil fuels to, to relax or eliminate every major ecological factor limiting agricultural productivity, from nutrients to water to temperature to plant competition to disease to insect herbivory. We have, we are, we're, we're very, we are, our big brains are very good at using this energy source to combat these limiting factors. And we've also used fossil fuels quite effectively to address labor limitations. And this, a uh, little bit out of date, Fu f gas is even cheaper than this in the US these days. Uh, but this contrast in minimum wage to a gallon of gas, how much either of these costs, says a lot about why we've gone down the energy pathway that we have. One gallon of gas contains the equivalent amount of work energy as a human expends in 100 hours of labor. $3.40 versus $7.50 an hour, or $750 to capture the same, the equivalent work uh, amount. Now, this sounds outlandish, but I have looked hard at these numbers by, by Pimentel and Pimentel, and I have come to believe that they are approximately right. And it, it's, it's remarkable to consider this when we think of pulling out of a carbon uh, dependent society, um, which a lot of people are contemplating right now. In fact, the relaxing eco ecological limiting factors and, and labor limitations has resulted in the cultivation of corn on the North American continent going from almost no reliance on fossil fuel energy in the production process to where in Nebraska to grow one hectare of, of corn, 99.96% of the energy input is fossil fuel based. It's remarkable. So while the farming methods and practices have changed dramatically in the last hundred years on, the ecosystem itself has not. And this is at a time when we're expecting this ecosystem to produce more food with less inputs. Um, John Foley, from the, well, who was at the University of Minnesota, now with the uh, California Academy of Sciences, um, he's emerged as a, a large sp spokesperson for how we're going to feed the world by 2050. And he has suggested these, these five steps as being critical if, if we're going to tackle this and leave and have a habitable planet for ourselves and other species. Uh, he suggests we need to fees, fee, freeze agriculture's footprint, uh, grow more on farms we already have, use resources more efficiently, shift diets away from meat and animal products, and reduce food waste. How many of you are 
totally familiar with this listing of, of okay. So this is, this, these are in circulation quite a bit now in certain circles. There's kind of a consensus around these. They're hard to argue with in certain respects. But I want to highlight, too, grow more on farms that we have already have and use resources more efficiently. How are we going to do this? Well, uh, much of the agroecological community has come out with a, a, a vote towards ecological intensification. So there's a growing consensus that what Foley proposes could only be achieved with ecological intensification. But there's less of a consensus about what ecological intensification actually is. Um, and I'm going to spend a little bit of time un unpacking the concept here, as I think our work at the Land Institute is, is very germane to rounding out the definition. Broadly speaking, ecological intensification is in, con in contrast to input intensification, which, which was behind the Green Revolution. In ecological intensification, we're trying to supplant purchased inputs, often energy expensive inputs, with ecological processes to achieve the same outcome in, in production. So the orig original big release of the concept was made by Ken Kasman uh, in a, a PNAS paper in, in 1999. And I would call what Ken Kasman's definition of, of ecological intensification, I would call it being more agriculture resource efficiency intensification or resource intensification. Um, he was proposing variable rate fertilizer applications, higher irrigation efficiency, use of improved varieties. He did include integrative pest management into his mix, but it wasn't tremendously ecological, um, that definition. And I, and I credit uh, the Europeans for taking it far more into the ecological realm <clears throat> at least in the literature. But in looking through the literature, I came to realize that there's kind of three scales here, at least two scales right now in the literature, that, that mirror the ecosystem pyramid. Um, and I'm going to talk about each of these, the last one in some detail. The first is uh, mining ecologically relevant traits. And plant breeders have been doing this for a long time comes in at the organism or the population scale. Um, and it might mean going out into the, the prairie or native grassland in, in our part of the world, which is where this photo was taken, and looking for traits that are of interest. Um, one, uh, maybe obligate mycorrhizal, maybe this plant concentrates zinc, this one's drought tolerant, this one has nitrification inhibitor properties and either breeding them in to bringing them into the production system versus conventional plant breeding some are recommending bringing them in transgenically but essentially they are they are species specific attributes that can be incorporated into agriculture and and address some limitation there's a Author R. Ford Denison, has anyone, I'm, I'm, this is a two-way street, has anyone read this book, Darwinian Agriculture? <laughs> okay, so, <laughs> well, I won't delve into this discussion too much, but this, this, is, this book has been popular in the U.S., and um, Denison has critiqued the work of the Land Institute, and I would suggest possibly some people in this room, by suggesting that the only traits or characteristics in the natural world that agriculture has any business in trying to mimic or bring in occur at the species or population level. Because those are direct outcomes of natural selection, of evolution, they've been tried and, and proven to be superior potentially and potentially of use. So we can go mine go looking for attributes and, and bring them into the, into the cropping system. I'm going to suggest that there are other processes in, the, in, in nature at the community and ecosystem scale that are not natural selection, but, but definitely have the potential to benefit agriculture. So what, what are they? 
Well, at the community level, we know from studying native ecosystems that there's resource and niche partitioning, that some mixtures of species can utilize essential resources, nutrients, water, sunlight, more efficiently than one single species. This, this certainly can happen. And when you have facilitation, one species providing a resource that another species requires, it might be nitrogen from a legume or a parasitic wasp habitat or something like this, then you actually have the potential to have increases in net primary productivity as well with diversity. And this is just an example of a, a paper in ecology that would, uh, in, in nitrogen, form partitioning between species. Now, is, is Ricardo Bamarco in the room? Here? He was on the list to be here. Okay, well, I'm showing some of his work because um, Bamarco and colleagues have written a, a highly cited and influential paper that was published in 2013, focusing primarily on how biodiversity can contribute to ecological intensification. And he talked about how yield gaps exist in agricultural systems, and they're typically regulated by multiple limiting factors. Um, in this case, we have pests being the, the limiting factor that is putting the ceiling on crop production but that if you eliminate the pest problem, then there's other limiting factors waiting in the wings, right? And so in, in his case, he, he talked about how diversifying the cropping system, maybe adding a hedgerow where, where a biological control agents can reside, um, that you can actually address this limiting factor with biodiversity and move the yield higher until it bumps in, in this case, to soil nutrients being the next most limiting factor. So he does a wonderful job illustrating how community ecology can contribute to ecological intensification. And he identifies, or they identify in their paper, a number of regulating ecosystem services that, are, that can be attributed to biodiversity. Again, diversity being an, a community scale phenomenon. In the paper, they also list all of these supporting ecosystem services that are soil based. But like almost everybody else interested in ecological intensification, there's no common denominator like biodiversity that is the driver behind these. Everyone just acknowledges, boy, these are also important. They're a really good idea. In fact, it, building soil organic matter is kind of the holy grail of ecological intensification. You get the biggest bang for the buck in many axes if you can pull it off. But it's always just identified as, as kind of a goal, but no one's talking about how to get there, such as through enhancing biodiversity with this side. And what I'm going to suggest today is that the driving concept on this whole side of, of, of agricultural goals is, in fact, the idea of succession or ecological development. At the ecosystem level, um, adding the ecosystem level to the concept of ecological intensification. So certainly, from our perspective at the Land Institute, all of these are necessary. And we're, and we're delving into every single one of them. But this is the one that has been entirely absent from the discussion. At least it has not been defined. And there's a reason why it hasn't been designed. And that's because the crops don't actually exist yet to get there. So I'm going to talk for the next few minutes about this idea of ecological succession, mo pushing the agricultural landscape from its arrested state in early ecosystem development, early secondary succession, and what would happen if we move it down the successional gradient further. And to show that this is not a particularly novel idea in ecology, I'm going to rely on two classic studies, two illustrations, one from the 50s and one from the 70s. Um, and I'm going to do that in, in discussing carbon accumulation. 
And again, this is an ecological process that is not natural selection. It happens in nature, and I think that agriculture would benefit tremendously from examining this process and bringing it into the agricultural system. This is, a, a, this is starting actually from primary succession. This is a figure from Crocker and Major, 1955. Carbon accumulation in, in um, primary succession following the retreat of a glacier at Glacier Bay, Alaska. And it simply shows over the course of, of 200 years how plants move in and they start to build soil organic matter it's how the A horizons formed in any soil. And so this is just a natural process. We, we build soil carbon with, with primary succession up to a point where microbial respiration starts to match productivity and then you heat, you reach something of an equilibrium in soil organic matter. Now I've never done this before, but I've taken that slide I showed earlier and just of, of cultivation of what happens to soil organic carbon over the first 70 years, and I've, I've flipped it around <laughs> because this is exactly what will happen, has been shown to happen, as soon as we stop plowing the soil and replace annual crops with perennial species, you start to reverse this trend and rebuild soil organic matter. Now we know this happens because of uh, a number of activities that have already happened in, in, in many countries. One is uh, restoring grasslands. Um, there's a program called the CRP program in the U.S. that paid farmers to take uh, erodible lands out of production and plant them to perennials. And it afforded an incredible opportunity to take data from broad landscapes and, and measure rates of carbon accumulation. And that range is huge how much carbon accumulates in different soils over time under, under what were plowed, put back into perennials. But, but the average is around 330 kilograms per hectare per year of carbon resequestration. And then we have a lot of work that's been done now on perennial cellulosic biofuels. And this is a range of our, over the central Midwest in the U.S. of rates of carbon accumulation under miscanthus, um, about 160 to 820 kilograms carbon per hectare per year. So we can start to look at those as, as well, we could anticipate sequestering some amount of carbon like this if we were to shift from annual to perennial crops. And the, I, I mentioned that one of the reasons we lost carbon initially was because we disturbed the soil, broke up physically protected organic matter, um, stimulated microbial mineralization and respiration of carbon. But the other reason is that we replaced perennials with annuals, and perennials put a tremendous amount of carbon into the soil more than annuals. Annu uh, the annual crops on the order of 15% below ground allocation of their total primary productivity. And there's, of course, a wide range for perennials, but about 50%, maybe a little bit more, of their uh, uh, photosynthate into below ground um, organs. And that is where the soil organic matter of our landscape came from, and is the case with, with most native ecosystems. Just as a, had to put, stick a data slide in here somewhere. Um, <laughs> this is actually our perennial Kernza. Um, uh, it's a wheat grass, uh, Thinopyrum intermedium. And it shows its root biomass next to the annual wheat. This is in a study um, that, that Sprunger did in, at, in Michigan. And it just reflects for our crops relative to wheat this, this same uh, juxtaposition I was showing in the slide earlier. So there is a remarkable amount of below ground allocation um, in, these, in these perennial species. It, we couldn't resist going ahead and extrapolating out, well, what if we were able to plant all 70% of croplands that are dedicated to pulses, to grains, to cotton, um, and oilseed crops, annuals, what if we were able to convert them to perennials? How much carbon would, could we expect to sequester in a year? 
around our very conservative estimate, if you're interested in the assumptions, would be happy to do that. A PhD student from University of Kansas worked on this, around 0.25 gigatons um, per year uh, over 45 years or so. And, and so this ends up being about 6% of annual emissions from all sectors. 6%, it's not a lot, but if we cut our carbon use in half, all of a sudden it would be 12%, and uh, half again, a quarter. So this is a, you know, this could help. It's not the solution, um, but it is certainly a potential mitigating factor in, in global uh, carbon quandary. But of course, the, the carbon issue in the atmosphere is not the only reason. In fact, with, with ecological intensification, these are the real <coughs> benefits of the soil organic matter improvement that, that we might expect under uh, perennial crops. The other, the other uh, ecosystem function that I wanted to discuss is, is, car is nutrient retention. Um, and I wanted to discuss nutrient retention with respect to this model that was a, uh, my postdoc advisor, P advisor Peter Vitusik and his advisor uh, Rainer in 1975 published in Bioscience. And it's, it's still widely cited. This is a model of what happens to nutrients in ecosystems um, in primary succession. Um, in the top we have uh, net essentially net ecosystem production. So this is the accumulation of organic matter in an ecosystem over successional time. And in the figure, the, the ecosystem starts to grow for the first time. Plant growth exceeds uh, respiration for quite some time. I guess I'll use this. And, uh, and then you hit that plateau I was talking about where microbial respiration equals productivity or starts to and eventually you have uh, a net accumulation of carbon equaling zero. There's as much being respired as there is in primary production. And so what's happening with nutrients is that there's a, 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 a point here of nutrient input. It could be 100 kilograms nitrogen, it could be 20 kilograms of, of potassium being weathered, but the aggregate nutrient input is sitting here irrespective of the vegetation. And it's suggesting, this figure is suggesting, or in the model, that once succession begins, the nutrients, this, one way to think about this is the nutrients coming out of a watershed at the bottom of a, of a, of a, of a whole basin. And if you're testing the nutrients in that water, you have a bunch of them coming out or I should say the amount coming out is equal to what's coming in through atmospheric, atmospheric deposition, nitrogen fixation, and weathering. And as soon as the plants start to grow, the plants are regulating the nutrient availability. They take up the nutrients and you have very little, zero in fact, with limiting nutrients coming out of the bottom of the watershed until net ecosystem production starts to equal zero and then the nutrient availability comes back and you have essentially whatever's coming in is what's going out because the ecosystem is not accruing any more biomass. That was a little lesson in ecology. What we're really interested in is what happens with a disturbance. So we go all the way around this figure. We disturb the ecosystem and what Batusik and Reiner suggest happens is that you have this tremendous pulse of nutrients that comes out of the ecosystem when you knock back the mature ecosystem for the first time. And, and you'll have a huge spike of nutrients and then all of a sudden the vegetation starts to regrow and this whole process happens again where nutrients are drawn down and become very limiting in that regrowth stage. So why am I saying all this? Well, th this whole theory was put to the test at Hubbard Brook one of the long-term eco ecological research sites in the U.S. Uh, it's a deciduous hardwood forest. And what they did, here's a picture of the watershed. <laughs> it's a rather extreme experiment, actually. They, they clear-cut and herbicided a watershed for years and watched the nutrients come out of the bottom of this ecosystem. And not surprisingly, I mean, most people are like, well, 
duh, of course this is what's what happened, but we, you know, we're scientists, we gotta see that it actually does, and it did. All of these nutrients spiked in the water that came out of the bottom of this watershed when it was in this condition in a spectacular rate of nutrient loss. There's no roots holding it, the soil organic matter is declining, it's just dumping them. And then once the forest starts to regrow, the, they disappear out of the water column again and, and you have a, back to more of a natural system. Of course, Hubbard Brook is what we're doing every year in our agriculture. Uh, we eliminate the roots, we draw down the soil organic matter, and the system itself has an almost impossible time retaining nutrients. Um, Steve uh, Coleman is now at Ohio State. Uh, he did a study while he was at the Kellogg Biological Station in Michigan, oh, excuse me, um, in which they measured nitrate leaching under annual wheat, which this is a profile of, um, versus Kernza, again, the intermediate wheat grass, the Napyrum intermedium. These are the, this is the root system, actual root system under Kernza in this profile, okay? They had three levels of fertilization, high nitrogen, medium, an organic N, which was a chicken manure equivalent to the medium N. And the blue line is the, um, is the perennial Kernza, and the dotted line is the nitrate leaching out from under the annual wheat. And uh, what we can see is that the Kernza leaked during the establishment year, right? And once it was established though, it virtually did not leak at all. There was a little bit here, and, and they had this treatment as higher than best practices. They were loading that with nitrogen, but the uh, rate of nitrogen loss, nitrate loss from the, uh, from the wheat was spectacular, uh, just under 150 kilograms nitrate over two years cumulative. So I'm going to run through one more brief study uh, to, to underscore this idea of nitrogen retention and then relate it to the soil microbiome, which is a whole area that I haven't talked about. We've been thinking maybe of roots and soil organic matter, but one of the very exciting aspects of going down the successional gradient is what is going on below ground in the microbiome that may facilitate a different agriculture that we've never explored. This is a uh, prairie hay meadow. There's a few of these in, the, in central Kansas. Almost all have been plowed, so it's very unusual to encounter these. Um, but wherever they are, it still exist, they are always hayed. And this one has been hayed for about 75 years, the same amount of time as adjacent um, wheat has been cropped. And we, uh, a study led by Jerry Glover that I was involved in um, a handful of years ago, we went around to five pairs of prairie meadow and, and wheat and compared a number of things. One was the, the nitrogen economy of these two systems. The annual wheat system receives about 70 kilograms hectare per year of nitrogen. The perennial hay meadows have never in this study been fertilized uh, with any nutrients. And export in the biomass is, a, is equivalent, a, a remarkably similar, uh, about 47, 48 kilograms of N leaving the system in the harvest every year. The nitrogen remaining in the soil organic matter, now this is interesting, we have about 11.7 tons per hectare in the perennial or in the wheat, and about 15.4 in the hay meadow, in spite of the fact that it's not, f so darn it, in spite of the fact that it's not fertilized um, and that you have the equivalent and export as with the annual system. So without taking this into account, we had about 66% nutrient uptake efficiency over time. But when you take into this account this drop in soil organic matter, 
And if you assumed that that sole organic matter mineralized linear over 75 years, which it didn't, but if you made that assumption for simplicity's sake, you would see a total nitrogen uptake efficiency of about 40% in this wheat cropping system. Now, we know that most of that end mineralization probably happened on the front end, early end of when this was plowed. And so all we can say is the nutrient uptake efficiency is somewhere between 40 and 66%. But again, it is a, a very leaky system given how energy expensive nitrogen is and how much havoc it wreaks on the environment around it uh, when it leaves the cropping system. Steve Coleman um, went underground and looked at the bacterial communities in these hay versus wheat systems. And um, in the, he used uh, DNA fingerprinting to, to analyze the bacterial communities on this side. And, and in these ordination analyses, he showed how the perennial systems diverged or clustered distinctly on an axis from annual. The, the, the black circles are annual systems and the white circles are perennial. And the other thing that came out very clearly was the, the effect of depth on structuring the bacterial communities down to 40 centimeters. Tiana DuPont did the same, uh, did not the same, but a different set of analyses, totally different taxa, totally different methods using my microscopy, but showed how the soil nematode communities also broke down on the same axes, perennial, annual, and with depth. Now, Jerry Glover went and, and overlaid um, vectors of four indices of soil health on top of this, showing how they lined up, in fact, with the uh, bacterial communities. Um, in other words, the, the correlation between uh, readily oxidizable carbon and the bacterial community that's found in the perennials was high. Um, and, and that's true with all of these attributes, total soil nitrogen, water stable aggregates, uh, and soil organic carbon as a whole. No causality, just intriguing that you would find these properties where these bacterial and nematode communities exist. Now there's a hint of mechanism in the nematode community itself. These are uh, soil depths in the annual wheat, soil depths in the perennial wheat, and how the, the nematode community is carved up based on functional groups de designated by Howard Ferris at UC Davis. Uh, Tiana DuPont, who did this work, did a, her PhD under Ferris. And the main thing I wanted to point out is one, that the, the uh, annual wheat was much more dominated by bacteria um, feeders than, and fungal feeders or fungal feeding nematode in the uh, perennial hay meadow, which relates somewhat to the carbon and nitrogen ratio, a lot more nitrogen in this system. But this associative plant associate nematode community is one that has been identified as critical in mineralizing nitrogen. And this is just an example of, of something that we might find that would be surprising in a soil that is more mature. Because I'd asked, how is it that this soil can m mineralize that much nitrogen on an annual basis without disturbance? 49 kilograms per hectare per year. And so, Presumably, things are going on in the soil microbial community to drive that, and this is just one example of what might be happening. For the sake of time, I'm going to skip the phosphorus example. I did some work at Rothamsted with a similar comparison um, between annual uh, wheat and a perennial hay meadow, and simply found that organic phosphorus was much more dominant, not surprisingly, in the perennial hay meadow, as opposed to what's thought to be not irreversibly, but, but uh, tightly bonded phosphorus in the annual wheat. And it looks like we may be able to maintain higher levels of available organic phosphorus in perennial systems relative to 
annual systems where the phosphorus gets tied up inorganically. An area that we are researching right now at the Land Institute that is of considerable interest is how much um, nitrous oxide comes off in denitrification in these perennial agroecosystems compared to annual systems. Um, there's lower standing nitrate and, and less water-filled pore space in the perennial system, but much more available labile carbon than in the annual system. And so the jury is out, I can tell you that. There's no clear answer at this point, but um, I, it's obviously a, a germane topic of interest. So hopefully, I've, I've made a case anyway that there, if we had the perennial crops, that, that the ecological intensification that would take place at the ecosystem level by moving the agricultural system from a highly disturbed state of early secondary succession down to a mid-successional ecosystem may have tremendous benefits. And in fact, it would achieve some benefits that researchers interested in ecological intensification have not really identified how we're going to get them. Um, mainly increase in solar organic matter, but also nutrient uh, retention. We sometimes like to think of uh, the landscape we're on being a, a, um, an adaptive peaks landscape, where we're down here, uh, and we've been on this for the last hundred years, working on annual cropping systems and, and optimizing them to a remarkable extent. And we're very near the adaptive peak of annual agriculture. We're getting very small returns for major research efforts, and there's good reasons for that. We have optimized the system to a remarkable extent. And we're suggesting here that there may be another peak out there that carries with it, at least with respect to ecological intensification, and maybe things like yield, um, that we have not approached. But to get there, it's very messy, and it scares agricultural researchers to death, uh, because when you go down the valley here, there's chaos. And I'm about to show you some, okay? And the, the rest of the workshop will be addressing a little bit of this chaos. But we, we addressed this chaos the first time we delved into agriculture, too. Essentially, we need new hardware. This is a, a, a picture that my colleague Lee DeHaan put together showing a laptop computer built on hardware from uh, the mid-90s, early 90s, and it can be done. And it's kind of like achieving ecological intensification on certain axes with the hardware, cropping hardware that we have right now. It can be done. But boy, if we could come up with something better. And so uh, I wanted to just give you a brief overview of, of the breeding work of perennial crops at the Land Institute. The rest of the workshop today, I think, is focusing on this area more, and so I'm not spending a terrible, a great deal of time on it, but I'm certainly open to questions. Um, domestication, we're, we're taking the tact of domesticating crops, and we're doing white hybridization, as is being done here with barley. Um, we're working on perennial oil seeds, um, Silphium integrifolium is a, a native of the prairie. Uh, this is one of the few crops that did originally come from the U.S., got made a lot bigger in, in Russia or the Soviet Union, um, but it originated from seeds about this size. And we are essentially trying to take seeds about this size, this is Silphium, and move it in that direction through rounds and rounds of, of selection and intermating. This is why we went after silphium um, and the dr serious droughts of 2011, 2012, this species did not flinch and uh, virtually everything on the landscape was dry and crunchy and, and, and dead. Um, and it was, it's, it was so apparent that we thought this really is a species that may suit the uh, Great Plains of the U.S. in the climate that's coming. Um, and here you can see uh, 
the landscape on Sep on June 19th, a couple of years ago, and this is what it looks like on the same day um, in the silphium patch. And uh, so it has quite a bit higher net primary productivity, which equates into greater water use. But this we're working on understanding how this plant does survive long droughts, and it, and it undoubtedly relates to the volume of the soil water that it is able to exploit to get through these times. But there's some interesting ph physiological work to be done on this species as well. Kernza, which I've already mentioned, intermediate wheatgrass, uh, Lee DeHaan is looking for needles in the haystack like this um, in his selection efforts. This shows over four breeding cycles how the uh, proportion of the population of different seed weights has shifted from this time zero of the original germplasm of the wild species, moving it to about eight, going from a mean of about three to about eight milligrams per seed on the way to 20 or 25 that would get close to wheat. Here's a, a high a, a genetic mapping population where we're looking for molecular markers of free threshing and non-shattering, tillering, uh, even maturity, head morphology, seed morphology. A lot of different traits are, are tracked, and, and this is part of, part of the work that Lee DeHaan's doing with colleagues at the University of Minnesota. And one of the breeding populations of Kernza, about 14,000, plants that he tracks on an annual basis. Um, and Kernza does lend itself easily to be machine harvested. And it can be grazed. And here, I had the little movie, but it didn't make it over on the, on the flash drive. But this is uh, a Kernza plot being sowed at Alnarp uh, by Eric Steen Jensen, who's, who's right there. Uh, and um, it is a uh, increase plot for a long-term part of a, a long-term uh, cropping experiment that they are initiating this fall. Um, in contrast to the domestication, we're undertaking wide hybridization where we cross ang the annual crop as it exists, wheat, sorghum, and our colleague uh, Fengi Hu in China, rice, with a wild perennial relative to essentially introgress the perennialism into the annual crop. And this is definitely going down into the valley uh, before we get up the peak. Uh, the perennial sorghum, you can see the grain sorghum or milo in the US uh, crossed with sorghum halpens, a noxious weed in the US. Um, and then uh, F1 here and through a series of back crosses and further intermating you start to see seed heads that look like this, not yet at the grain sorghum level, but Stan Cox, who is a extremely renowned USDA wheat breeder who's come over to lead this project on perennial sorghum has made wonderful progress in, in coordination with Andy Patterson at University of Georgia on genetics. And this is really what they're looking for, re-sprouting sorghum in the spring and rhizomes on the, the perennial sorghum crown. Lots of keeping track again. And, and this, is, this is exciting. These are a couple of the sorghum patches that we have in, in uh, Africa. These are in Uganda right now, uh, where uh, there's a couple of studies sp sponsored by USAID um, to look at how our germplasm behaves in a, a, a following a a uh, dry period, not following a winter, essentially. So, what how, will it resprout? And in fact, it did resprout for the first time. This is in Uganda, um, and it produced grain a second time around. And the idea is that if this germplasm is stable, we would look at uh, intermating it with landrace varieties in in different parts of Africa. We're in Mali at Ikrasat is where some of the trial plots are. This is in Uganda. Um, it's in Ethiopia and South Africa as well. Perennial wheat, one of the most challenging. Shuen Wang is our breeder there and uh, making the cross between annual wheat and, and different thinopyrum species. Um, and uh, because the 
annual wheat is, uh, can self, uh, the uh, classic demasculation has to take place. That doesn't have to happen with the Kernza. The perennials are, are outbreeders uh, or outcrossers. But um, there, there is a lot of success landing on hybrids that re-sprout, but they produce more than one seed head in a summer. The vernalization genes are more inherited from the annual wheat, it turns out, and Shuin is very focused on trying to uh, have the, the vernalization genes from the perennial parent be the ones that are actually controlling uh, vernalization. And, and, and the hope is that then the perennial wheat will only head up once, go into a vegetative stage, and, and persist through the summer um, and winter. More, I'm happy to talk about any more of this at a break. And finally, just to let you know that, that the rice is being worked on in, in the Yunnan province of China, some work that initially started at Erie and then was adopted by the, the Yunnan Academy of Agricultural Sciences, and uh, arguably they have made the most progress on arriving at a, a high-yielding perennial hybrid, partly because they don't have the summers and the winters that we're struggling with in some of the more temperate regions, but it's very promising, and uh, we go there about once a year to check in on the project and, and talk. And finally, um, ecological intensification, again, is not just about succession, uh, it's also about diversity. And so putting some crops together, both to look at how disease spread may be suppressed, how uh, insect infestations may be reduced, but especially, in my case, how nitrogen might be supplied by an intercropped legume is work that we've, we've delved into seriously in the last few years now that we have protocrops to work with. And um, I think I'm going to probably wrap it up there because uh, we have gone on long enough. But uh, happy to talk about any of this with you during a break, or I'll be here for the next uh, couple of days. And Anna's in control of the uh, dance card, so uh, please sign up. Um, these are some of our global partners working on this project, and um, happy to say that uh, SLU is among them. Uh, you are up here, aren't you? Sec there we are, all right. Thank you very much. <laughs>